Once there was a king by the name of Ahab, hello, who took a queen by the name of Jezebel. Hello, I'm evil. Ahab was a powerful king, but an easygoing sort of fellow. So when Jezebel came into the picture, she began to make some changes. Change the trees. Yes, dear. Build an altar. Yes, dear. Kill the prophets. Oh, I don't want to. Fine, I'll do it myself. Needless to say, God didn't like this one bit. And before long, Ahab found himself in a world of trouble. Uh-oh. Join us and discover where Ahab went wrong in Once Upon a Marriage. this month, okay, because I want to hear next year when I say, ladies, how many of you had a good Valentine's Day? I want this place to just blow up, all right, men? Men, I'm just, I'm just saying, men, well, not necessarily this place, but wherever we're at, I want it to go buck wild, all right, and that wasn't buck wild today, so we, we got a lot to learn, so I'm glad the Lord has put this marriage series on my heart, so I have a question today. Ladies, I'm, I'm going to go with y'all again. How many of you ladies um, struggle with wanting to have things the way you want it? You know, you, you you want to have it your way. You want life to be like Burger King. I see a lot of ladies' hands up. All right, um, men, men, we're we're usually pretty aggressive, right? But I just want to know how many men here are frequently aggressive, like at work and in their hobbies. But at home, at home, sometimes you let a little more things go than maybe you should. Is any men here today that you're kind of a little more passive at home? And ladies, is there any men here that are so passive they didn't raise their hands? If that's so, we just lift our hands up for them. <laughs> just, just checking. Um. Listen, today, that's what we're looking at, and, and that's why I'm so thankful for the worship, because I want to see a fire lit in everybody's soul, a soul that we can't, or a, a fire that we cannot control, and today we're looking at control. That, that's what we're going to look at today. In fact, we're going to take a look at one of the worst. If you think you have struggles in your marriage, where do you see what we have in store today as we look at Ahab and Jezebel? Does anybody know the story of Ahab and and Jezebel. I'm not going to go a lot into King Ahab today. I'm just going to, we're going to explore the relationship between Ahab and Jezebel because that's the whole point of once upon a marriage. Remember, we're looking at Old Testament marriages, hence the once upon, but we're looking at Old Testament marriages and we're going to see what we can get out of it, how it applies to us today. And one of the most frequent problems we see in marriages is something we see with King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. So before we really dig into this today, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, today that you will anoint my tongue. Lord, I need you to just move me out of the way. We need you to move me out of the way because we're dealing with marriages, something the enemy wants to attack, something the enemy wants to destroy. And I pray, Lord, that you will proclaim your truth through me today and that hearts and minds and ears will receive your word, Father, and that we will apply it because we want marriages that honor you. We want marriages that fit into your God-ordained plan for marriages. And Lord, we know the enemy wants to come against them. So I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that they will receive your word so that we can have stronger God-centered marriages. As we spoke of last week, you are number one. And Lord, I pray that you will be number one even in our marriages. And I pray that today you will speak through me. I do ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, just looking at the context here, what we're looking at is really one of the worst marriages in history. And in the, in the context, Ahab was actually, he was the seventh king. 
He, he was the seventh king of the northern tribe of Israel. He actually ruled historically probably somewhere around 875 B.C. to around 855 B.C., about a 20-year period that he ruled. And Ahab was really, um, he was really a strong political and military leader. And, you know, some of you guys raised your hands um, when I said strong in your work and your hobbies. That's kind of how, how Ahab was. He was a fairly strong political and military leader, but he let some things go at home. And, and we're going to look into that. Um, Ahab, he, he really, he had an opportunity because some of you know who Elijah is. Anyone ever heard of the prophet Elijah? I'm not talking about the guy who plays drums here sometimes. I'm talking about Elijah the prophet. I mean, just a man of God. And he lived during the time of King Ahab. And he was going out and he gave Ahab many opportunities. He called him to repentance. And at one point, Ahab even refers to him as his adversary. The prophet of God becomes the king of Israel's adversary. That's not a good thing. You have to know that's not a good thing for the prophet of God to become the adversary of the king of God's chosen people. You see, that's that's not a good situation. And the reason is, is because Ahab, he was leading his people astray. He had them into all sorts of weird things like calf worship. And, you know, when they were out in the desert, you remember when the children of Israel were in the desert, they erected a golden cow and that, that didn't turn out so well for them. And now Ahab, hundreds of years later, he's he's leading them back into calf worship again. I mean, he's got some weird things going on. And really, it, it just got even worse when he married Jezebel. In fact, Scripture tells us that King Ahab led his people into more evil than had ever been done, ever been done in all of Israel. He led his people into more evil than any other king before him, and it got worse when he married Jezebel. Now, the name Jezebel actually means, where is Baal? And Baal is a false god. So her name is like, where is Baal? We're, we're going to live for Baal. And he marries a woman who wants to live for Baal. We need Baal in our life. Where is Baal in our life? And you know, church, we don't need Baal in our life. We need Jesus Christ in our life. We need the one true God, the living God in our life. But her name is saying, like, where is Baal? Where is this false God? That's who we need. And Ahab married that. So, I mean, I'm telling you, this guy, he's making some bad decisions in his spiritual life. And this really does apply to us today. And I'm going to show you how, um, as we look at this, this is kind of the verse that sets the tone today. First Kings chapter 1, verse 25 says, No one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab. And I want you to notice here, he didn't do it alone. King Ahab didn't do it alone. Look at what it says. No one else did so, compl so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did under the influence of his wife Jezebel. Under the influence of his wife. Ahab and Jezebel represent two of the most common problems in marriages today. They represent the passive husband. The passive husband. That's your first one in your outline there. The passive husband. I looked up, I looked up the definition of passive and it said accepting or allowing what happens or what others do without active response or resistance. Passive. Represent, he represents the passive husband and Jezebel. Jezebel represents the controlling wife. The controlling wife. Now, I know some of you ladies are getting ready to throw some things at me. I, I, I know that some of you are like, whoa, hold up. What's he going to say today? But this is God's word, and we're going to look at God's ordained plan for families today. So I looked up again the definition of controlling, all right? And the definition of controlling is to exercise authoritative or dominating influence over. So I want to look at this today. Because what I said, I meant this is a common problem even today in marriages, the passive husband and the controlling wife. So we're going to start here with the passive husband, and I'll give you a little context. What we have going on is King Ahab, he has a neighbor. He has a neighbor named Naboth. And Naboth has this, this field that he wants. It's a vineyard that he wants. And he wants it so he can actually go out and plant a vegetable garden. So he, he gets together with him and he says, hey, you know, I, I, want, I want your vineyard. I'd really like to have that. I'm the king and I'd like to have your vineyard. And that's where we're going to pick up. In verse 2 of Kings 21, it says, Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden since it is close to my palace. 
And right now, I'm just going to pause for a minute really quick. Y'all remember the time when I told you it's, it's another problem with men today, and it's just, it's a fact, it's reality, it just happens. All of us men have one chick thing. Like, every, every man has one chick thing. What, what I mean is, like, we don't like to chase after women chick thing. What I mean is, like, you know, some guys like, you know, rom-coms, romantic comedies, you know, they, they really like those. Um, in fact, I recommended one to Todd earlier today. You know, I, I told him about this great dramatic comedy that brings tears to your eyes because it's kind of my kind of my chick thing, you know, and um, some people like some, some guys, you know, actually get manicures. That's kind of weird. And I was thinking about my daughter, Alyssa, yesterday getting a pedicure and that made me think about the guys that actually get manicures. Are, are there any of you here today? Good. Um, <clears throat> another, another chick thing that men do is like their hair. You know, some guys actually have more hair product in their bathrooms than women. I mean, this is true. And it's okay to have one chick thing. And for Ahab, his, his chick thing was um, a vegetable garden. Any guys like to plant vegetable gardens? Oh, uh, yeah. That's your chick thing. That's why your hair's jacked up. Um, so Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden since it's close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. See, he's kind of going into negotiations here. I'll give you something in exchange or I'll pay you what it's worth. He's opening negotiations here with Naboth. And Naboth says, look, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Now look at what Ahab does here. So Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth, the Jezreelite, had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. What was that? What a baby? Yeah, I was going to say, let's just call it what it is. He was a wuss, okay? He went home and sulked in his bed because he didn't get his, what he wanted. He says, I can't have my vegetable garden. I'm just, I'm just going to go home and I'm going to lay in the bed. I'm not going to eat. I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay in the bed. And that, that is something that guys tend to do. We don't think of ourselves as doing that. We're too strong. But oftentimes men really do when they don't get what they want. And they're supposed to get what they want. Say, so, you know what? I'll just take my ball and go home then. Mm, sound familiar now, don't it? That's really going home in your bed and sulking when you say, I'll take my ball and go home. And when we put that analogy to it, men, we are guilty, huh? When it's that manly context, not just laying in bed crying, but taking our ball and going home. And that, that is exactly what Ahab has done here. He says, oh, I can't get it my way. Well, then I'll just take my ball and I'll go home. He's being, he's being very, very, very passive here. Um, women, I want to tell you something today that, that you have to understand. And you probably already know, really. It's not really a secret. Us men, we're, we're, really, we're really insecure. You know that? Men are insecure. Typically, the stronger we project ourselves to be, the more insecure on the inside we really are. And it's so important today as we're looking at the passive husband and the controlling wife, I need you to get this, that women, you have the power to build up and tear down. You have the power to build up and tear down. It really goes back to the garden, okay? It really goes back to the garden. I love taking things back to the garden when everything was perfect because God created the land. He created the heavens, the earth, the fish, the birds. He created everything. And what did he say? It's all good. It's all good, right? Everything is good. It's all good. Everything here is good. But then he saw that for man, it's not good for man to be alone. Because, like, he won't brush his teeth. He won't do no laundry. I mean, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. You know, he's got to be reminded of some things. So God said, I will create him a helper. I will kill a helpmate. Yes, a helpmate. And I've told you before, that word helper is the exact same word used for the Holy Spirit. And I know some of you women are like, man, I don't want to think of myself as having to help no man. But I'm telling you, that's what Scripture says. She was his helper. And that's what I want to look at today because women, you have the power to build up or tear down your man. You have the power to build up or tear down your man with your words. Your words, Proverbs says, they have the power to give life or to destroy. And you can build up or you can tear down with your words. And Jezebel, Jezebel with her words, she tore down. Let's, let's look at um, 
what the controlling wife does. Um, it says, his wife Jezebel came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why are you not eating? He answered, well, I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, I said to him, give me your vineyard, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I'll give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you, I will not give you my vineyard. So I'm just, I'm just laying in the bed with my ball here. I brought my ball and I'm, I'm laying in the bed. And, and look at what she says. Jezebel's wife said, is this how you act as king over Israel? Is this how you're going to act? I mean, really, is this how you act? Is it, you wuss, get up. What is wrong with you? Is this how you're going to act? You big whiner, you loser, laying up in the bed, crying you're the king? What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And she says, get up and eat. Cheer up, you bum. It doesn't say bum. I added that. That's, that's, a, that's a Derek word there. Okay. Get up and cheer up, you bum. I'll get the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. I'll do it. You just move out of the way. Let mama get a hold of this, all right? Mama knows what she's doing, all right? You just back up. You just go, you just, you just get up and eat. I'll take care of this. I'll lead. I know what I'm doing. You just sit down. I've got this. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm hearing, I'm hearing dang it, huh? See, <laughs> that messes me up hearing dang it up here. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, what she's doing right here, if you think about this, and this, this is your next one, your outline, she's belittling him with her words, right? She is belittling him with her words. Think about that. I mean, can't you hear the tone? Is this what you do as the king of Israel? Is, th that's why I added you bum, because, I mean, it's really there. You can sense it in the text. You get it. Is this how you act? And she's belittling him, saying, you're not doing enough. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You will not lead. You're not doing what you have the power to do. You're just going to lay up in the bed. Why are you just laying in the bed? You have the power to do this, and you ain't getting it done. And she's belittling him. Now, he, he probably deserved it because he's not doing anything. And, and I will share right now, there's a difference between a passive husband and a lazy husband, okay? I, I want to I throw this out there. Because some women, some women, you are married to men that, that just don't do anything. They just, they just don't do nothing. And if that is you, I don't want to belittle. If you've got a lazy husband that won't work, you, you've got to, someone's got to go out there and get something done. And if that's all they're going to do is lay in the bed and not eat, well, nobody's going to eat. So at that point, a woman has to do her thing if he just won't do it. But there's a difference between being passive and being lazy, being passive, and that's what we're exploring today. And I'm going to show you how this passivity works. Um, she's been belittling him with her words. And um, because of all this, you know, when you're belittled with your words, you kind of stop doing things. It becomes where you're no longer lazy. Like we've all heard that story of, of a person who, you know, is, is they don't tell you. Maybe, maybe you know. Maybe someone's told you, man, um, a, a woman will come up and say, I, I've my husband, he's just not leading me spiritually at home. Women, ha has any of your girlfriends ever told you that? Guys that are, that, that, are, that are talking to people, have you ever been told, you know, by someone else, ma'am, my husband, he's just not leading me spiritually at home? I, I heard, literally, I mean, this is real, I heard a story from another pastor, and he said, he said that a woman came to him because she was just really struggling at home. She was ready to leave. You know, she's just fed up. This guy, he ain't doing nothing for her. She's just tired of it. She's ready to leave. And she comes and says, you know, my husband, he's just not leading me at home. He's not leading me at all in no shape, form, or fashion. He's just not leading me at home. And, and I, I want to I wanna chase after the Lord, and I know that he's supposed to be leading me. He's not fulfilling my expectations. Remember last week we talked about expectations? Um, well, these are actually God's expectations, and men are supposed to lead. And she has a legitimate argument when she goes to the pastor. He's not leading me. Pastor, can you talk to him? Can you, can you talk to my husband? And he says, yeah, I'll talk to him. So he, he scheduled a meeting with the guy, and, and he brought him in, and he said, listen, um, I'm going to tell you the best way to start leading at home. And this is actually what I told y'all last week, because it is the best way to start leading in a God-centered marriage. You remember last week I said, if you want to start leading a God-centered marriage, just reach over right now and grab your spouse's hand and say, 
Lord, we're going to chase you together. You remember I said that, that and I was talking about praying with them? And that's what the pastor recommended because that's just what us pastor folk do, okay? We're going to say, take it to God. That, that's just what our advice is going to be. Now, we might get a, a little deeper, but that's always going to be the start. Go to God, okay? Take it to God. So he calls him in and he says, listen, you know, um, your wife is saying this. And the guy's like, well, I don't know how to lead. And he says, you just pray with her. Just pray with her. And the guy's like, like many of us guys are like, oh, I don't, I don't what? Pray with her. I don't know how to, I don't know how to pray with her someone you know like i can barely pray on my own without falling asleep um so praying with someone else i don't know how to do that and he says look just talk to god take her hand and just talk to god and and say that you're going to chase god together you're going to chase god together that's what you're going to do so he says okay that's that's what i'll do i'll, I'll try it and um they, they they he gets home and you know and he grabs his woman by the hand and he, he starts praying with her right and after after they're done praying, um, he, you know, he, he was just listening to the pastor's advice. He wanted he wanted to do this thing because he really wants to keep his marriage. And she says, you call that a prayer? You call that a prayer? You think God's going to answer that? And do you know what that did to him at that moment? Well, he took his ball and he went home. That's what happened. And that's what happens with your words. You belittle us and we say, okay, okay, you don't like the way I did that? What do we men do? I just won't do that no more then. You say, you don't like that. Well, then I'm just not going to do it. I gave you your chance to pray, and, and you said it wasn't good enough. Now, what she really should have done at that moment, and, and I'm kind of half joking here, but I'm kind of half not really, on um, what she really should have done at that moment, she should have said thank you so much for praying, and then she should have laid the just most aggressive 30 minutes, just holding him in her arms that she's ever held him, you, you hear what I'm saying? You, you hear what I'm saying? Um, I, I mean, I'm being funny, but really, why? Because, man, we're, we're really, you know, we're like puppy dogs. We are. We're like puppy dogs. I mean, men are like puppy dogs. Like a puppy, you know, you, when you're training your puppy, what do you do? For good, positive behaviors, you reward him, right? You give him a treat, scratch him behind the ears. <laughs> He's a happy puppy then, right? And he'll keep doing what you want. But you throw a newspaper at him, and he runs, and he cowers in the corner. And what she should have done at that moment to establish him so he would keep going has encouraged him and, and scratched him behind the ears a little bit. You see, but with the power of her words, she tore him down. And he says, I'm not going to do that anymore. You need to know a godly woman will make a weak man stronger. But a controlling woman will make a weak man weaker because he will take his ball and he will go home. Ladies that had your hands up. I'm talking to you today. You hear me preaching? Because I'm telling you, and you've got to get this. This is so important. The next thing, the next thing a controlling woman will do is she will, she'll take over. She'll, she'll take over. I, I want you to watch here as Jezebel comes in and she just really takes a driver's seat. She says, I'll get you the vineyard of Jaboth the Nezrelite. I'll get it for you. And I'm going to give you an example and, and I think this is a good example, as, as Greg and I was um, in the front seat of the van going to Dallas. Like, you know, in, in the front seat of a vehicle, you got two, you got two different seats in the front seat, right? And you got the responsible seat, and then you got the carefree seat, right? And, and that's kind of, kind of what we had going on, except for sometimes I had to be responsible and shout, stop sign! But other than that, it was pretty much carefree. I mean, it really was, you know. He was the one. He had to be paying attention to the signs. He had to be watching the road. He had to know where we was going. And me, all I had to do was, like, you know, pick the music. I'm DJing, you know, and, like, talking about different things. I, I wanted to hang my feet out the window, you know. Not really. I just joked with him about that. But, I mean, you know, in, in, the, in the passenger seat, you, you don't have responsibility, Right. Well, what happens when a person, when a woman comes in and takes over, when she says, I'll drive, eventually, eventually the man says, oh, oh, so I can stay in the passenger seat and play with the music with my feet out the window, drinking my drink, not worried about nothing? Why do I want to drive then? If you're going to drive all the time, why do I want to drive? And that is what happens when you have a controlling wife. Who wants to be the driver all the time when you just sit back and chill out? And that's what we men sometimes do, don't we? Like it gets easy and we just, we just want to chill out. And we cannot let that happen. We cannot let that happen. Um, 
I'm, again, I'm, I'm not saying if, he, if he's not working that you don't come in and do something because you have to. What I'm saying is you don't get in the place of him when he is trying to do what he's supposed to do. Because when you take over in that, he's not going to do it anymore. He's going to sit back and relax. And usually this isn't in the big things. It doesn't start out the big things. It's the small things like um, dads. I've got every dad in here and you don't have to raise hands. I don't want anyone broken ribs today. Dads, how many times did we try getting our kids ready in the morning? You know, but they didn't exactly match, right? And mom would take them back into the bedroom and say, you don't know how to match nothing. So finally we said, <laughs> so all I got to do is get myself dressed in the morning then. I tried, it didn't work. So I'm just not going to do it. Or, or maybe, maybe it's loading the dishwasher, you know, stuff around the house, those small things like loading the dishwasher. And she comes in and she's like, the cups don't go here. The cups go here. And you're like, <laughs> I'm not going to drive that no more. I'm just going to sit back and ride. I'm not loading the dishwasher. You're going to complain all the time. I'm just not going to do it. And women, you are creating this behavior in him, Fold, folding the Folding the washcloths, you know, maybe maybe he just, you know, he just folds it over once and folds it over again to a little square. But maybe you think you fold it into a triangle and you fold it into another triangle. And he spends his time folding these washcloths and you come in and you're like, life is just going to not be ever any good anymore if you don't fold these washcloths in triangles. And he's just like, <laughs> I sure won't because I'm not going to do any washcloths anymore. Vacuum in the floor, you know, like you, you, you want the lines going going vertical in the living room and he he vacuums and for some reason they're horizontal and you come in and you re-vacuum guess what he won't do no more vacuum he just won't do it that's the way men are that's what we do if you're saying we can't win this game we take our ball and go home women that's what we do and you've got to know this because you get upset when we're not doing what we should be doing but it's through trial repeated trials where it happens it's a learned behavior we're saying we're just not going to do it and that is not what god wants in our homes now women i'm not saying it's all your fault men we have a god-given responsibility to lead in our households we have the god-given responsibility to lead in our homes we are called to lead we are called to lead and our wife our spouse young men young women that are hearing this I'm, I'm establishing you for you what a godly marriage looks like god has position this isn't a thing of power this is a thing of position christ is the head of man and he has positioned man as the head of the household as the head of the household, and he is to lead in his household. And, and you know, it's not something that, like, men, that, that we have to be taught to do. Maybe it comes harder for some, but it's in us. It's in us to lead. It's in us to lead, men. It's in us to lead our homes. You don't teach, you don't teach a, a tiger to hunt, and you don't teach a fish to swim, and you don't teach a woman to nag, you know? <laughs> Sorry, I was just having a little fun there. I'm just having fun, guys. Come on, can I not have fun today? Listen, men, it is in us. It is in us to lead. God wired us to do it. He wired us to lead our homes and to lead our homes strong. So I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to keep it real simple because, men, that's just the way our minds work, ain't it? We're just, we, we just need it real simple. Don't we? So I'm going to give you three things. Three things things men that you are called to lead in and the first one is you are the provider now i'm not going all back to the 1960s saying she's supposed to be at home barefoot and pregnant spitting tobacco juice or anything like that that's not what i'm saying she can make more money than you do what i'm saying is you lead and you set the financial tone and direction of your household and you say we're not going to go in debt we are not going to max out our credit cards we are not going to do that we are not going to go that direction i know you make more money than i do and that's okay man praise god that we're able to give our kids more than we're able to because you're making so much but we're not going to go in debt 
That's not the way we're going to go. And, and, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna tithe because we're a God-honoring family and we're going to do this thing. That's what we're going to do because we're going to honor God. And what you're doing there, you may not be the actual provider bringing home the bacon, you know, but you are setting the tone and direction. That means you are leading and providing, okay? I, I don't get up here and sing, but I lead this church. I don't have to be the one doing it to lead, to set the tone and direction. You see what I'm saying? Christ is my head, and he tells me, he gives me the vision, and I share it. And it's the same thing in a household. Men, you've got to lead, and you've got to set the tone and direction of your finances. You provide. And you know what? A woman needs that. Ladies, don't you want that stability? It's not necessarily about, but you want that stability. That financial stability will unleash a woman, man. It will unleash them. You've got to be the provider. The next thing is you've got to be the protector. When I say the protector, man, you know, all right, first, the provider, second, the protector. I'm not just talking about like when someone breaks into your house. I'm not just saying you use every single weapon you have stored up to just bust them up. I mean, you do that too um, in Jesus' name. But um, what, what I'm saying is like you protect them. You protect their hearts. You protect their minds. You love them so that they know, so that they know that you are completely, totally, faithfully devoted to them. You protect their hearts and their minds. You protect them. You protect your women. And you know what else you do to protect your woman? You protect your kids. Protect your kids. It doesn't matter what everybody else is watching what everybody else is doing, you protect your kids from negative influences. You protect them from the things of a world gone astray. You protect your household. You set the tone for what is and is not acceptable in that home. You set the tone, you set the direction, and you protect your home from the enemy and his ways. You provide you protect, and the last thing is, and this is where you guys are going to be like, oh, no, no, I'm leaving. I can't do all that. It's too much. Um, you pastor your household. You pastor your household. I'm not saying um, you sit down every single night and do a three-hour exegetical study on Romans, you know, um, because, listen, there, there's not many world men in the world prepared to do that. There's not. What I am saying by pastoring them is you say, you know what? We're going to pray together. When we sit down to eat, we're going to pray together. We're going to pray and we're going to thank God that we have a meal today. We're going to thank God for this because there are people everywhere that are starving and we have a meal. And we're going to thank God for the blessings that we have, even when it's fried bologna and mustard, okay? We're going to thank God for what he's given us. And we are going to be active in our church we're going to do that thing. If we're in town, we will be worshiping with our church family. That's just what we're going to do. Okay, I know sometimes we're tired, but we're going to fellowship and worship with our church because the Bible says don't forsake the assembling together. And that's what we're going to do. That's the way we're going to be in this household. And you know what? We're going to we're going to get our kids involved. We're, we're going to send our kids to youth camp. Speaking of youth camp, we do have a youth camp coming up and I'm going to share more about that. But that's the types of things we say when we're passing in our household. I'm not saying you got to preach to them. I'm saying you lead, you set the spiritual tone and direction of your household, men. You set the spiritual tone and direction. You provide, setting the tone for the finances. You protect, setting the tone for what influences, and you pastor, which means you set the tone and the direction of the spiritual health of your home. Man, it's what God called us to do. This is what we are supposed to do. And you can do it. You can do it. It is in you. You just step out into it. You just step out into it. And I know maybe some of you have tried. You've tried and she's like, I've heard this before. You, you've done this before and it don't last. Listen, if you will keep on stepping out there if you will keep it if there's any christ in her at all eventually the spirit of christ within her will respond to what you're doing and it will say i'm going to come alongside my husband as his helpmate as his helper and i'm going to help him fulfill his purpose in christ jesus do you hear me that is what she is going to do if you will just keep on keep on 
pushing. I talked about Paul saying, run the race with perseverance. Press on. Remember, press on. Well, we're going to press on in our homes. We're going to press on. And I promise you, men, and I know the women right now, I see it on their faces. Man, I want my husband to do that. Men, rise up. Rise up and lead your homes and lead strong. Lead strong. And you can do it. And you better do it. And let me tell you why. <laughs> let me tell you why. <clears throat> You remember when we was doing Why Sold Out, and I told you, as a pastor, I will stand before God one day, and I will have to give an account for um, the way that I lead. And, and we went through Scripture and saw that. Well, we also see this in a very non subtle way in this relationship between Ahab and Jezebel. Okay, so we're going to go back to the story here of them. And what we have, she told him, I'll get it. I'll get your land. So what she does is she, she, she sets up this idea, this very evil plotting, manipulative, deceptive, just evil idea. And she says, we're going to throw a party and we're going to make Naboth the guest of honor. <laughs> and we're going to invite two scumbags up in here that will lie for a little money or something. We're going to invite them in. And then we're going to have them say that Naboth is accusing both God and the king. And for his blasphemy, he'll be taken outside the city gates and he will be killed. He will stone to death, and that's exactly what she has done. She has these two guys lie on him, and he is taken outside the city gates. Nabal, the guy who just wouldn't sell. I mean, really, really, Ahab didn't even give him a chance to sell. I mean, honestly, guys, we're kind of negotiators, and if the king comes to you, and are you going to accept his first offer? No, it's the king. You're going to be like, no, no, I don't think so. Now, he, he brought up God. We don't know if he would have sold or not, but I do know me, and I know most of you men. You're not going to sell on the first offer. You're going to try to get more, especially from the king. If he wants it that bad, he'll offer more. That's all he did. And she has him stoned. Very evil. Very evil. And, and let's go into scripture to see who God's going to hold responsible for Jezebel's actions. Verse 15. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, Get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, that he refused to sell you. He is no longer alive but dead. And when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and he went down to pay, take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Here he comes. Well, Elijah's coming. When Elijah comes to town, you know something's going down, okay? And Elijah, the Lord says to Elijah, go down to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard where he's gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Now, who set up this plan? Who did I just tell you set up the plan? Jezebel set up the plan. Jezebel had it done. But look at what the text says. Look at what God says right here. This is what the Lord says. Have you, have you, have you, Ahab, have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says in the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood. Dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Yes, yours, husbands. Yes, yours. God held Ahab responsible. Because Ahab is the head of the household. Ahab is the head of the household. And he didn't lead his wife. And he didn't stop her from doing it. And God held him responsible. Men... God will hold you responsible for your homes. Do you hear me? And women, if you love your men, you better know that God's going to hold them responsible for your homes. God is going to hold your husband responsible. And you don't want your husband getting his blood licked up where the dogs licked up Nahab's, do you? Men, it's time to lead. And women, it's time to come alongside them in our God-ordained roles to help them fulfill their purpose. And guys, if, if you think your purpose is to raise a championship athlete or a spelling bee winner, you're way off. That is not your purpose. Your purpose is to equip the next generation to be sold out followers of Jesus Christ. That is your purpose. That is your God-ordained purpose to teach and proclaim to be the provider, 
to be the protector and to be the pastor of your home. That's your ultimate purpose. I'm not saying it's bad to want to do those other things. Those are good desires, man. Those are good desires. But your ultimate purpose is in eternity and equipping the next generation to proclaim the name above all names. Do you hear me, church? Because if you do, you can say amen to that. That's right, man. That is our purpose. And men, that is our challenge. That is our challenge. I, just, I really, really, um, I do need to take one second really quick. I was going to have you bow, but I want to take one second really quick. Um, even though she's not in here. I, I just need to publicly say about my wife, man. My wife has come alongside me as my helper. And sometimes, sometimes she wants to fight. But you know what? She says, you know what? I trust you as a leader in my home and I will follow your reckless, crazy, wild, moronic ideas because you say, thus saith the Lord. And if you're saying it and you're living it, then I'll step in behind it. And since you're living it and you're saying it, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm telling you, church, you can all give her a hand today because I could not be up here if she had not stepped out of the way and said, you chase after the Lord then and you lead my household. You lead it because God's called you to do it. And if that means when you lead my household you lead us into leading a church then let's do that thing i support you and i couldn't do it without her and i'm so thankful for a wife that said i will help you fulfill yours and our family's purpose in christ and women that's what i'm calling you to, to, to do today is help your husband as his helpmate as his helpmate help your husband ladies help your husband fulfill his purpose his god-ordained purpose as a minister and as a follower of christ to equip the next generation to reach people in his name that's that's what i want today and now we can all bow our heads and close our eyes i'm going to start with you ladies i want every eye closed. I don't care if you're on leadership or not. I want every eye closed. Ladies, if you know, if you know today that you've been overly harsh, you've been overly critical, and you feel God moving within you today, and you know that sometimes maybe you take over Maybe sometimes you say things that bring them down with the power that can give life or death. If that's you today and you want me to pray with you and you want to know that every heart in here is praying alongside you in this. If that's you today, can I see your hand, ladies? Man, I, thank you, Lord. Let's pray together for the ladies. Lord, thank you for for speaking to these women that sense their divine calling to help. And that doesn't belittle them, Lord. It's just their position that you have created them for to come alongside their men and support them because it's not good for man to be alone. And you have a purpose for everyone you've created, Lord. And I pray today, I pray today, Lord, that you will empower and equip these women to not belittle and to not take over, but to come alongside and lift up and encourage, Lord, to let their men get out of the passenger seat and drive, Lord, and drive their family towards you. Father, I thank you and I thank you that their hearts have been spoken to. And I pray blessings over those women. And I thank you for their courage. I thank you for their courage to admit, Lord, that sometimes they're not who they need to be, but I do know that we are new creations in you, and by the power of your spirit within, I pray you will change them to be the godly women you've called them to be so that they can be in the godly household that you've ordained. Now, men, again, I want every, every eye closed. Men, maybe you've been a little too passive. Maybe in your work, your hobbies, these different things, maybe you go get it. But maybe at home, you've, you've stopped. You've stopped just because maybe you, you were told you didn't do this right or you didn't do that right or maybe you just haven't been doing it. 
Men, if you believe the truth of God's Word today, if you believe that you will be held accountable, and today is the day you're saying, it's time. It is time for me to leave my household. And I want you to pray, Derek. And I want this church praying alongside me in the heart. If that is you today, men, and you are ready to lead your homes, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Amen, men. Amen. And amen. Let us let us pray. Father, I pray over these men today, Lord, and I lift them up to you. Lord, I pray that as you've wired them, Lord, I pray that you will empower them to fulfill their purpose, to lead their homes, to protect their households, to set the tone, to set the direction of what influences them. Lord, to provide for their households, not necessarily being the biggest breadwinner, Lord, but setting the tone and the direction of what stability will be like in their homes. And Father, I pray you will empower them to shepherd their homes. Lord, let them lead strong in these things. And Father, I pray that if they face any resistance by the power of Christ within their spouses and within them, that they will remain persevering and they will push on through, fulfilling their purpose in you, Lord. I pray you will anoint these men, that these men will rise up to lead their homes and lead strong. Lord, I pray that we men will lead strong in our homes as you've called us to do. It's so important because we will answer for it to you. Lord, we fail you so much. Give us the strength not to fail you in this. By your spirit and because of your grace, we believe that you will give us the strength to lead our homes. And we claim this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I know this wasn't the super feel-good marital sermon. But still a very real marital sermon. Hands everywhere today. And it's a new day. It's a new day. We say we're going to change the world. And it's going to start in our homes and the way we lead in our homes, men. That's how we're going to do it. And women, I know you women are on fire ready to do something, man, because you women come up to me, Derek, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? Let's do this. Man, you are ready. And today's the day that our men are going to lead and you women are going to help and we are going to do something up here. Do you hear me? Today is a new day. It wasn't feel good, but it was feel real, right? It was feel real. It's time. It's time to step out into God's ordained plan for our homes. And one of the ways that we can do that today, we can make the decision to continue with our worship through our giving. I said a long time ago in my household, we will serve the Lord and we do it through the way we live and we do it in our giving because we are not we are not going to steal from God you know I, I heard something the other day when I was in Dallas man and it was just so good it was just so good um, so many people so many people how many of you in fact I'll ask you right now if you won the lottery right now how many of you plan on giving a buku to the church right Hands up everywhere. That's what I'm talking about, man. That's exciting. You know why? Because here's the thing. We all like to think about what we give to the church if we had it, but nobody wants to think about what they have that they're not giving to the church. Amen? We all raise our hands for that. We give it if we won, but yet we're not giving what we have, what God has called us to give. And today, men, I'm looking at you men. Today is the day where you set the financial tone where you set the tone and you say, this is the day. This is the day that we're going to trust that God will open up the floodgates of heaven. Today is a new day. We say that's what we want. Well, let's do it. So as the ushers come forward, I'm going to just pray over your hearts and pray over this offering today. Father, we come before you, Lord, and I'm so thankful for everyone here, Lord. I'm so thankful that they give their times 
Father, all those that volunteer and serve, Lord, to make a difference in your kingdom and all those that are wishing and wanting and looking for their place to serve because everyone has said, I want to make a difference. And Father, I pray that as they want to make a difference with their time and in their service, that they will trust your will and your word with their finances and that they will serve in that way because it unleashes us. It unleashes us to meet the needs of the people that call and have electric bills going out or they they need a little gas money to make it to a doctor or all the different things that we constantly hear. It's through this that we're unleashed to make that difference. And we can tell people we do it because Jesus said so. So, Father, I pray today, I pray today that everything that the men in their households and if it's if it's a single family or whatever, everything that we decide to give, that we lay at your feet returning to you, I pray you will bless it and anoint it and use it to fulfill your purpose here in this city and expanding on and on as we go forth under your leadership, advancing your kingdom as you are building your kingdom. Father, I pray you will bless this offering. I do ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.